<laughs> okay, I think we're going to get started. Uh, hello, good afternoon, and thank you for coming. My name is uh, Juan Miro. I'm the uh, Associate Dean for Undergraduate Programs here at the school. I'm also a professor here. And uh, it's an honor for me to get today to introduce uh, Sinclair, uh, Sinclair Black, to all the, all the uh, people from the school and from outside the school that came today. It's a historic moment in our school. We're celebrating uh, Sinclair's teaching for more than 50 years in the school. And Sinclair likes to count in semesters to make it even more <laughs> impressive. 100, 101 semesters, so it's more than 50 years. You know. right. Richard Dodge used to count in semesters too. I remember the first time he told me, I have been teaching here for 68 semesters. <laughs> so uh, 101 semesters is a lot of semesters and it's a big part of the history of the school. So it really is uh, uh, an honor to have been uh, a colleague of Sinclair for 20 years. 20 of those 50 years I've been a colleague of his. And, and it's, been, it's been a privilege to teach and learn from him during all this time. And there are a lot of things that we can say about Sinclair that are part of the exhibition downstairs and things that he's going to say himself. But I, I want to just focus on, on, on three things that I think are, are uh, fantastic about the way Sinclair is an architect that are particularly close to me, but I think that it could be very helpful also for students to take with them as, as, as three, three ways of being an architect that I hope they never go, never go away. And they're very evident in the exhibit of his work. Uh, one of them is Sinclair is an architect that is constantly curious and learning about the world. I mean, I think that that's one of the things that in academia, you find a lot of people that are interested in, the, in, in keep learning. And I think in the case of Sinclair, you can see just from seeing the exhibition that he's uh, the type of architect that is always curious, always ready to learn about the things that are out, outside you know, in the world and traveling and learning from what he sees. He draws, he takes photographs. He was take, telling me about the new panoramas that he knows how to take now of the spaces that he's exploring when he travels. I think it's fantastic to be able to see that in architects with uh, successful careers, but constantly learning about the new things that they discover when they go and travel. This is something that is very important for the students. It's not just when you are in school that you're learning, you're learning for the rest of your life. And I think that Sinclair, in a way, just trans, you know, you know, you can see the, the, the joy of learning when he talks to you about the places that he has visited. When we share notes about Mexico, when we share notes about the trips, uh, he likes to learn about the stories of the places that he visits and why they are the way they are. And it's, and, and it's a fantastic uh, exchange when you, when, you, when you try to, when you, when you have this conversation with him, especially when they are with a napkin that he can sketch on <laughs> and tell you all the things that he's, he's, uh, he's coming up with just from seeing a place. So this is a great thing about being an architect. Keep learning, be curious, keep your eyes open, document what you see, and, and, and keep learning. It's, a, it's one of the joys of, of being an architect, that we can keep learning the rest of our life. It's very evident in Sinclair's case. The other one is that Sinclair is an architect that can operate at any scale. There are not many architects that can say the same thing. And when you go to the exhibit downstairs, you can see that the range of scales is really amazing. And, and I think that this is something that I hope architects don't lose the ability to see as their, their canvas is just anything from you know, uh, an apartment to a highway to a neighborhood, an entire city, a building, a school. So Sinclair is still seeing this as part of his role as an architect. He can have a hand in how those uh, different scales can be shaped. And we live in a, in, a, in a time where we tend to specialize a lot and you know, people that do one thing, they only do one, that one thing. And, and if you work in urban design, you, you don't work in residential architecture. In the case of Sinclair, he just comfortably moves scale from a single family house to an apartment building and a school and a highway. And that's, I, th is, I think, something that, unfortunately, I see less of, you know, because it looks like we have now, a set, and this is what I tell my students as well, don't assume that you are only doing you know, the building and the urban design belongs to someone else. In a way, he has been claiming the urban design as, as the natural field for architects to <coughs> expand on. And I think it's, it's very evident in the exhibit downstairs. So this is another thing that I hope it never goes, goes away. And, 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 and I hope that what we have done in the school is try to instill this in 
in the student just by seeing the, the work of Sinclair. You know, so he operates at any scale, and I hope that that's something that can stay, stay with us uh, uh, as a school and as, uh, as the students that come through school uh, in their careers. And the third one is that Sinclair is an architect that doesn't sit and wait for the commission to come to him. <coughs> he just goes for it. When, when he sees an opportunity, when he sees a, a, a something that can be improved, he doesn't sit and wait hope that it's going to happen. He's going to go out there and he's going to spread the message. He's going to work for it. He's not sitting and waiting for the commission to come. That's another role. Architects sometimes are very passive about waiting for things to come to them. And then, yes, when I have the commission, I can work on the design. Sometimes you have to be the idealist, the one that comes up with ideas that you can promote in your community, the one that can, you know, you know, preach with example, and you know, when he saw opportunities in downtown, he would move there, he would do it, he would make it happen in ways that is beyond just, I get a commission and I design a beautiful building. And I think that, that that's a part of Sinclair that is an idealist, that I hope that it never goes away. Also the idealism of like, yes, I have an idea and it's going to happen, I need to push for it. And people are saying, oh, it's too complicated, I don't care, it's a good idea and therefore we should pursue it. This is also the, the Sinclair that we know that you need to have some levels of stop, stubbornness, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sinclair, the idealist, Sinclair, Sinclair, the provocateur. You know, when you provoke discussions, you provoke with these ideas, and you also bring that sense of why not? If we are, if we are proposing it, even if it's complicated, you cannot just sit down and you know and, and, and not do it because it's complicated. And I think that this is one of the things that I know for sure that even if Sinclair, ha he, he has done it, he has said it repeatedly. He's retiring from the school, but he's not retiring from his professional life. So we're going to keep hearing more of these proposals. On the <laughs> contrary, probably we will hear more so now because it's going to be less busy. And, and I think this is something that I hope that we can hear, keep hearing from the school because in a way, it's very sad that this is the last semester that Tinkler is teaching with us, but it's also great to know that he's going to continue to work and he's going to continue to <coughs> pursue these three <coughs> approaches that he uses in all his work. I mean, he constantly is going to be proposing things that I think are going to make our city uh, better, which is one of the things that he has been doing for 50 years. So I'm looking forward to see everything that is still coming out of his uh, <laughs> mind, and I know that it's going to be uh, still a connection that is going to be very strong with the school, so we're going to keep seeing you here, I hope, Sinclair. I know that you're going to be able to take time off now during the year, during the semesters, you know, not just in the summer. And, uh, and you know, I'm really, I really, uh, I'm really honored to have been your colleague for all this long, and, and I think that it's a great school because you have made a great school out of the 50 years that you have given us to us. So. Please help me join join me in welcoming Sinclair to. Thank you, Juan. <clears throat> you said I was stubborn. I'm a Capricorn. <laughs> That's the trait. <laughs> as far as you being here 20 years, I don't believe that. <laughs> this is the new kid on the block, I'd say four or five years maybe. <laughs> As part of my new theory, or particularly for the students for the rest of your life, don't blink <laughs> because something's going to be over past. It only goes past once. So um, there are a lot of things to talk about. Um, first of all, the show is called Beyond the Studio because what that means is that for, for architects, that's me, I guess. <laughs> this, this is the two sides of me, the toy maker and the urbanist. So I'll show you some of all that. <laughs> um, my uh, mother, uh, looks like about three years or four years before that, uh, when I was born, bef long before that, she they had had a house designed and it was such a cool process that she uh, asked the architect said well if I, if I ever have a son and this was like five years before I was born what would I do uh, to encourage him to become an architect and he said one thing let him draw keep him drawing so I was drawing by the time I could figure out which end of the pencil made the mark 
and uh, never quit, really. Uh, I slowed down, unfortunately, but I, <laughs> I never quit. <laughs> um, let's see how this thing works. Um, first of all, this is, this is a truly great school of architecture. Uh, it always has been good. It got better and better and better and better, and it continues to get better. And as people like Juan and Cisco and others show up here, it's going to continue to get better. But what I wanted to say here uh, was that this is a great place to spend 60 years. Okay, that's five in school. Five in practice coming over here once a week to a lecture or crit or giving a lecture, and then 50 years teaching. So that's a total of 60 years. That's pretty scary. <coughs> but I bet there's not a place in the world that would be as good to spend 60 years. When I came, that was the faculty. I don't believe <coughs> any of those people are still here. Does anybody know? Gerlinda is not. She's in town. Yeah. Uh, Richard Swallow was at the opening a couple of weeks ago, and and very few others uh, are still around. Um, anyway. So I started teaching in 67. I was working at a, a pretty, good, pretty large firm. I think at that time it was second or third largest firm in town, Barnes, Landis, Goodman, and Youngblood. And I was, I was very, uh, not very bashful about wanting to design things, and so they let me. So I had the corner office of all glass and was designing away, and I got a phone call about 11 o'clock or 11.30 one day, and it was Alan Taniguchi, the dean. And he said, can you have lunch? And I said, of course. You don't tell the dean you can't have lunch. <laughs> right? <laughs> 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 and uh, so we went to lunch, and he said, I want you to teach a course. I said, Alan, I never even thought about that. Not, not only that, I don't have any desire to do it. And on top of all that, I wouldn't be any good at it. And he said, no, no, you'll be fine. Trust me. I want you to teach this course. And so, once again, you don't tell the dean no. So I said, very well, okay, when? Next fall? And he said, well, it's, it's in, on the third floor. It's a third year studio. And it meets at 2 o'clock. <laughs> so I did a little calculation. <laughs> I said, you mean today? <laughs> he said, yeah. So I walked into a class which was full of veterans from, I guess, Korea, and I was well below the average age. And then, so I just had to fake it. <laughs> so I had about 20 minutes to get a program for a branch library and walk in and say, okay, here's what we're doing. Um, and then um, the rest is history. I kept doing studios. This was one that was a, <laughs> this was a, a great studio. Uh, I believe that's 79, uh, a little after I started, um, and, and before I left for graduate school. But uh, what we did, we took an afternoon off at the studio and took that three or four hours and went down and cleaned up this historic house for a women's organization that was going to buy it or occupy it. It had not been lived in for many years. It was full of trash and dust and a few dead animals. and So we just spent the day cleaning it out. And um, at the end of the day, I managed to, you know, show up. Or I was there all along, but I managed to get a bunch of beer there. So we sat on the front porch and drank beer for about 30 minutes, celebrating the cleanup. Um, a lot of these people went on to become very successful. Uh, for example, uh, ah. <coughs> this guy. What album? Uh, that guy right there, Mike McGlone, who was here Saturday, um, is the next TXA president. And a lot of these people have, have gone on to do great things. Okay, uh, teaching, I discovered, has a pretty good schedule, unless I got trapped in summer school, which I only did once. 
<laughs> and uh, so I was able to get out and about and travel quite a bit. And, and later I started, a lot of this is about travel and study. It's about taking students to Mexico and to Europe and to England. And um, I did 12 of those programs. And they always had, uh, you know, requirements. So it was a history requirement, a visual communication requirement, a design requirement. And it, it sort of history was the first three weeks, and uh, traveling and uh, sketching and picking sites and doing little vignette projects were the next five weeks, and then come back and have a, have a site and do a design project. <coughs> from Mexico, seven years from Mexico, we come back. We had been visiting sites, so we brought the, those sites back and did design projects on those sites. And the Ibero School in Mexico uh, would do the same site and bring their students up here at the end and have a joint review. So the Mexican project, Austin project, the Mexican project, Austin project. And we'd fill up the review room and make a real learning afternoon out of it. But traveling allowed uh, a lot of uh, great experiences that I hope don't end. In fact, that's one thing that I'm going to do now is <laughs> travel more, especially this summer. Um, there was a strange, there's Mike again, the, the next president of TXA. Uh, I don't know who that is. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I'm one of the few people who does know who that is. <laughs> uh, the firm name is Black and Bernoy, and for the last 20 years or so, even before that, people would say, who is this Bernoy guy anyway? So I, I started saying, uh, well, it actually doesn't exist. Uh, I made him up as a figment of my imagination. And so if anything bad happens, I blame him. <laughs> um, most of you have never, whoop, damn it, I don't have all these buttons. Most of you have never uh, met Andrew. So I want to introduce you to him. Um, stand up for a second. Andrew was a, was a great partner. He was a great partner, and he, <clears throat> he went to Canada for a year, and then he went to be the dean at uh, Texas Tech for 14 years, and now he's chasing moose and bear and <laughs> lion and things around Montana, at, at Montana State University. Um, in any case, uh, travel and sketching. This is sketching in the office. Uh, to, to who knows what project and what stage, but early. Uh, and so there are four or five kinds of drawing that I do besides the office. That, uh, you'll never see any of those drawings, uh, hardly any of them, from working on projects. Uh, uh, and, but when we were in England, it was, this is a uh, catch that date, uh, 82 in York in England. Uh, and that's looking from York Minster into the downtown uh, over that. Plaza. Um, I, the other kind of drawings that I did were teaching. In other words, we couldn't go to those places. We couldn't go to Greece and wherever that, <coughs> in England and Paris and Mexico, <laughs> and Leaning Tower pizza, or that's pizza, I guess, and uh, that's Dubrovnik. But I, through the years, was able to go to all those places and still have done, um, and will hopefully do this summer. Uh, but I would show a slide, and I'd give the students X amount of time. These are probably 20-minute uh, sketches. So in a, in a lab situation, we'd turn out the lights, and I'd project up uh, uh, the pictures one at a time, and say, OK, let's talk about the geometry of this place, the geometry of this artifact. Where are the center lines? Where's the horizon line, of course? And then proceed to draw it with a timer. Uh, but I would do it with them in every single case, just to show them I wasn't as lazy as they thought. <laughs> uh, but it was a good, good exercise. And then in the travel programs, 
Uh, this was one in Europe, and that is a place that none of you will ever go. It's part of the foundation basement uh, of the uh, uh, one of the churches on top of the mountain in Salzburg. Uh, and I was walking through that space. And I said, man, this is kind of interesting. Look <coughs> at the vaults and cross vaults and, you know, the place on the end and, and down here and, and uh, then these windows. There's the wall thickness. There's windows that let the light in. And then there's this buttress so that it's right under the church. So I went back and walked through it and just did a plan and then I projected the plan up. But that was the kind of analytical drawing that I asked the students to do often. Uh, and then there's the literal kind of drawing. This is one hour uh, at this chapel by Gaudí outside of Barcelona. And I just did the drawing and later on I did the watercolor and then after that we hung Christmas balls in it with Photoshop and had it made a Christmas card out of it. <laughs> well, that, all, that whole thing took about 20 years. But <laughs> Uh, I only did one etching because I had a friend that created a press, a flatbed press, and so I did one etching and it was from a panorama photograph uh, that I had taken on a, tr a, pre a previous trip. Uh, and I've only ever done one, but I made about five prints and gave them for Christmas presents. The other kind of drawing that I would do is, um, and I describe this as just noodling, um, I used to, I don't do it now, but I used to sit around uh, in front of the television not watching CSI fill in the blank. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea what ever happened on any of those shows, <laughs> except that something like this would occur, and I think I was figuring out how to saw up lightweight concrete or make a block that somehow keyed together who knows? And then I had all these notes on there that I've never gone back to read. <laughs> it says key system, insulation, at the outside. I don't know. <laughs> um, and I'd have a lot of this. And part of the traveling, I had seven years in, in Mexico. Uh, this was not from that traveling. This was this Christmas. We spent Christmas down there. Uh, I, I feel a little bit like a Mexican. I've probably been to I don't speak Spanish, but I think I've been to more places in Mexico than almost anybody in Mexico <laughs> in those seven-year programs. Always a different place. Um, along the way, I've always been fascinated with this idea of panorama, and I only just this, about a month ago figured out what it is, what it's about. I taught drawing all my life here the, at Vis Viscom. And so I know all about the 30 degree cone of vision and how distortion happens and all, all of that. And I've even had the stu students uh, put them through the torture of constructing a radial grid to draw uh, uh, radial perspectives. And then made them phot photograph the square in Georgetown and plot it about 40 feet long and four or five feet tall, tape it in a circle and hang it from the ceiling and then go inside. And literally you just feel like you're there. Like, whoa, look at that. It's the way your eye actually sees, not the way the camera, normal camera sees it. And so, and then I never put two and two together, but at some point I realized it's the peripheral vision that lets you know you're in something, that you're not, at it, you're in it. And I call that being there. So there's a little sub show. One, one of the monitors has panoramas rolling uh, because uh, I've toyed with it my whole life. That is, taking pictures and taping them together. <laughs> and then that had this, the school has this funky Japanese camera that you wind up and it goes bzzz, and it paints the picture on a drum of film. And that's terrific camera. It's a lot of trouble and it weighs about 20 pounds. But <laughs> feels like that anyway. And then finally, you know, uh, for instance, this picture, they're all taken with the, my iPhone. <coughs> right there. Uh, and boy, what a, what a great 
boon for me because I was so interested. But it's that peripheral vision thing that, that sort of finally explained it to me. You know, you feel like you're there. You feel like you're immersed. So I call it being there. And they're flipping around on that monitor down there. <laughs> so um, that may seem like a strange part of an architectural lecture, but <coughs> how many have ever been there? Casa <laughs> Mila. How many people have been there? La Paz, a abandoned uh, uh, mining town in Mexico, taken at that Christmas trip. This was the Biennale, uh, an installation in, in the uh, arsenal at the Biennale. And so you, you can't walk through that room, and certainly not now, but this gives you a sense of what it was like to walk into that room and say, whoa, look at this movement and color. That was a favorite little uh, coffee shop, breakfast shop in Mexico over Christmas. Just a delightful little place. The whole place would fit in this room. Um, and that's Guanajuato, which is a pretty interesting mining town <coughs> near San Miguel. And now I want to talk about the fork in the road, that is the, the toy maker and me making our build toys and buildings and small things and concrete blocks and bookshelves and tables you'll see downstairs and the urbanist uh, concerned about everything from the, from the whole damn region and uh, all the streets and certainly the freeways but we'll touch on all of that um, the architecture uh, all kinds of architecture lake houses uh, th this house is is this so we got it designed and built, and we had all these little sketches about the kitchen and, and the trusses and sections and all that kind of stuff. I don't know what that is, but, um, and, a, and a cross section through the house. Uh, so uh, that's actually a different house, I'm sorry. So they were built at about the same time by the same contractor. Uh, so I made up that sheet for the owner and uh, 48 inches tall or something and watercolored it. Um, it was awkward, so it's gone, but the photograph is here. Uh, and that, that's a lake house. There are a number of these. And it, what would it have been, Andy? About 70, seven or eight or something, maybe? When we were getting really bombarded by energy issues for the first time, the very first time. And so uh, Michael Garrison was here, and there was somebody else here, the people that really created Austin Energy from this school. Um, and so Andy and I sat down and said, okay, what do we, what do we know about energy? Well, not much, but let's, <laughs> let's, let's uh, figure out what we can do here. Oops, sorry. Here. Uh, and so we were experimenting with, you know, the solar collectors and the you know, built-in greenhouse and then Underneath all these great big overhangs, there were ins insulated panels that could flip down and close in the glass box. And, and then the central fireplace in there was a, a steel jacketed column that went up through the roof and was full of water. And then inside of that was the flue and the box, thinking it would heat the water and in the wintertime. Well, we described it as the tent and the sleeping bag. And, and, you know, it didn't get built, but it was for a client. And, but we learned a lot about that. We kind of put ourselves on the f bleeding edge of that topic briefly. <laughs> uh, there's some more houses. Uh, the one that had the big colorful watercolor sheet. Uh, uh, this is, uh, that's actually the backyard of it. Uh, this one didn't get built, but I just like that drawing. Uh, this is where we really got down into the weeds and, and designed the railings and everything. And then this one, uh, I took that photograph about two or three weeks ago. We made a big, huge loop up through the hill country and photographed about four or five houses that had uh, been never never been photographed or uh, had been under construction for a long time. So moving up in scale, 
this is a project that was uh, built in uh, South Austin, just off South Lamar. It's called Kenny Muse. Um, and in fact, our, the general partner for the construction is here, uh, Nathan, raise your hand, right over there. And it was an enormously <coughs> successful project. Sold out in one week, 16 units, eight buildings. And we just took the code apart and said, well, you can do this and you can do that. It's actually uh, eight individual lots with an HOA. And um, so it was so successful that the city of Austin called a summit and said, we got to stop this. <laughs> <laughs> so they <laughs> we can't have creative infill in South Austin, damn it. <laughs> and so um, we, uh, th they came up with the McMansion ordinance. So this is, this is eight buildings and 16 units. If you went by the rules now, you could get four buildings and eight units, half the density, therefore half the value, therefore half of the taxes paid to the city. Oh, wait a minute, maybe that wasn't such a good idea. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, well, it was a terrible thing for the neighborhood, you can tell, just terrible. Density, oh my God. <laughs> uh, this is a duplex. There's an entry here and an entry over there. It looks more like a large two-story single-family house, but it's not. So everything about this, these eight buildings was exactly the same DNA, and nothing was the same. So the plate heights and the construction and the handling of mechanical systems and everything else was absolutely the same, uh, every, every one. What varied was the stone treatment, the porches and eyebrows and rhythms of supports and decks and color of the roof, and every one of them had, a, had an antique door. And sometimes those doors are, this, you know, two doors wide and 10 foot high, and in one case it was a single door that you kind of had to duck to get in. The guy that bought it was about 5'4". <laughs> Anyway, it sold out in one week and had 10 backup contracts. And by this point in time, this is uh, 11 years later, a lot of, they've all doubled in price and some have tripled uh, if you wanted to buy one. So we kind of have to say that was a success, but it's illegal, don't forget that. This was the second story of one that was my favorite and uh, family lived in it quite comfortably, I think. Then we move up in scale again. This time, we're talking about Amley downtown, which is that guy. It's a perimeter block building based on <coughs> late uh, 18th century and early 19th century uh, urban housing blocks in Chicago and New York where uh, it was a perimeter block building and had a courtyard or, in many cases, a motor court that, that you could see uh, along the edges of uh, Central Park. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, it's turned out to be, uh, uh, well, this was me having fun designing that building. We were the design architects and Page, Southern Page were the architect of record, so. Uh, Anyway, it's 200, 230 units on one block. One block is 1.74 acres. That's 130 units per acre, which is, especially 10 or 12 years ago, was unheard of density uh, for Austin and mostly most of Texas. Uh, it, I don't think the density has been exceeded uh, yet. It may be soon. They're taller buildings, much taller but the density is not there. This the density is achieved here because of the perimeter block. You just get to put so many units around the edges. And there it is built. That photograph is taken from our rooftop. We, we've lived in this old warehouse for 30, 35 or 36 years. And this was up on our roof and that building is a block away. And it, 
organizes itself around a 160 foot square courtyard which is over the truck chamber uh, that serves the restaurants and retails and things. 45,000 square feet of retail around the edges and 200 or 250 cars below that. Uh, none of which had been done before in Austin. I think it's pretty, pretty normal in real cities. But <laughs> 10 years ago, we weren't a real city here, 15. We're just thinking, waking up to the, to the possibilities. This was the streetscape on sec Second Street side. We were lucky to get to do that building uh, at the same time we were commissioned along with other consultants to do uh, Gerard, did I see you here? Yeah. Gerard and I basically uh, did the Great Streets Master Plan. So the Amelie Building and Great Streets Master Plan sort of produced Second Street. Uh, so now let's go up and scale again. How, how far up can we go? <laughs> uh, this is a plaque, and Hayden found this down there. It was about the uh, Town Lake Beautification Committee. Uh, in 1971, I was about seven years old. <laughs> and I was on this list with all of the luminaries. Uh, and uh, the, the, um, the committee was uh, organized in order to figure out what to do with a 6.1 mile lake or whatever it was, the trails, the cypress trees that are by now real trees were all planted as a result of that committee's political <coughs> uh, manipulation. <laughs> the what? <laughs> During that same time frame, uh, uh, here at the university, I got a flyer, and it, and it was from the National Endowment for the Arts. And it was called City Edges. I'm going to tell this story because of Trump and National Endowment for the Arts and Humanities. So um, it said we'd like proposals on what to do with um, city edges. And the examples they gave were the skyline of a city, or the mountains behind the city that define it, or, or what to do with these blurbs, urban sprawl, and stuff like that. And I just looked at my hand and I said, well, that's Austin. That's Town Lake. And these are the creeks around it. Then I went and counted them. There are 18 creeks. There they are. And descriptions of them all. Anyway, we got the grant, a uh, small grant, kept students working all one summer, and produced uh, a lot of drawings, uh, which are, some of which are in the show downstairs, and produced a <coughs> booklet called Austin Creeks. Um, there's a five minute walking distance. We did that to discover uh, what percentage of schools, uh, public buildings, uh, branch libraries, et cetera, were actually within a five minute walk of this system so that you might live, you know, uh, up here and come down and go to a branch library over here with, the, with Town Lake being the center. So it's 120 miles, uh, linear miles of creeks. Think about that. 240 miles of edges. I don't think I've seen a city that had 240 miles of hike and bike trails. But it, in gross theory, it's possible. <laughs> it's still possible because the city has done very little about the, to accomplish that. To the point where now the the fate of Shoal Creek and Water Creek are in the hands of conservancies, not the city. Everybody got tired of waiting for them to wake up to a good idea. Well, that led, inevitably, to thinking about the urban fabric in a different way. This is a map that we made, uh, a partial map of the city, <coughs> of what we call black holes. Of the three, three categories in black holes. There's the neighborhood that shall be protected but could increase infill like Kenny Mews. 
uh, uh, accessory dwelling units, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But basically, leave it alone. Let them learn, figure out how to pay their taxes themselves and allow that to happen. Second with the corridors. Well, you know we passed a bond issue for $720 million last November, which uh, calls for the, the re redevelopment of a number of corridors, and it does not include IH 35, which is the mother of all corridors. It, it has, a, has a greater impact, potential impact, than all those other corridors put together times 10. But nevertheless, the other corridors need help too, so they've got it. 720 million, a large part of that is for the corridors anyway. So the third thing of black holes is primarily, uh, well, this was done so long ago, it was before Mueller. So we said, okay, that's, that's the biggest opportunity we have, but it'll happen. And state schools all over the place. Brackenridge track has been batted around back and forth for years politically and continues to be uh, a right one. <laughs> uh, uh, this uh, 38th Street, 38th and Lamar, where Central Market is right here, that whole area up to 45th Street is going to be, if it's not already, on the block. That is, private sector, come in here and pay us millions of dollars and then <coughs> create urbanity right there. And we proposed it when we did Central Market, of course, right down in this corner, tried to leave uh, avenues open for a grid to emerge out into the rest of it. Yeah, the state wasn't interested in that. Um, so uh, the, the corridors, and, and like, this is a small sampling. I mean, think about Burnett Road, which is probably up there somewhere on if this map <laughs> could get there. Uh, they all have that potential. You're seeing it happen on South Congress, certainly on South Lamar. You're about to see it on South First Street. Uh, you see it somewhat on Burnett Road already. Th those are individual projects that unfortunately preempt a lot of the possibilities for great streets on those corridors. They could actually be great corridors, but rapidly, the possibility is rapidly disappearing uh, because of just, okay, there's a site, buy out that used car parking lot and build a four-story apartment building and be sure there's no setback <laughs> and hope you get some retail on the bottom floor. Uh, you might not. So. The, 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 the black hole theory extended to a, a, a lot of things. Uh, it extends to the whole region, and everywhere you look, there is a possibility. A, a abuse, misuse, not used, disused <laughs> land that's generally in public hands, almost always in the state hand. The good news is the state has been very inefficient at well, no, I beg your pardon, been very efficient at wasting money, very inefficient in its programs. And so now they're selling off land like uh, a Bull Creek last year, 75 acre tract, beautifully located on Shoal Creek next to Mopac at 45th. And so they got $42 million for it, 75 acres. Real deal for the developer. Anyway, so. We, uh, somewhere along the line, well, I know where along the line, in 1973, I went in, I, I was mowing a yard at a building my parents owned, which was an apartment, and a guy sitting on the porch named Chris, and I said, what do you do, Chris? And he said, well, I'm sort of babysitting that power plant down there on the lake. And I said, you mean Sea Home? Because I knew it was an Art Deco fabulous building. And he said, yeah, that's it. I said, can, can, can I come down there and see you and get inside? And he said, sure. So a couple of days later, I was down there. I walked inside. And um, that was, it was built in 52. That, this picture is so old that the old power plant was still there that when they finished this in two stages, they <coughs> knocked that down. And there's still, there was still a hole there. I think they filled it. Um, Anyway, this is one end, the western end of the city of Austin power plant. Wow, what an opportunity. It's an incredible opportunity. So from that point on, 
until a few years ago when this city finally woke up, I, myself and another guy would just organize tours ad hoc, get permission to go inside, submit ourselves dutifully to the, to the asbestos lecture, and then go on in. <laughs> and to take all group, groups through there, maybe 50 times or more. So we built a whole constituency <coughs> to that way to save the power plant. But it took 25 years or something. Um, right now, if you go down there, this is Boiler 9. It's, this has all been stripped out. It's a, it's a high-end bar and restaurant. It's really pretty darn cool. It was Boiler 98765. Uh, that powered this plant. Um, this was when it got cleaned out. We saved it in a curious way because the utility company was just hell-bent on demolishing the building. And we observed that, well, you really don't have enough money to demolish that building. That's too much concrete. So we got bids from demolition companies, and the likely one uh, most of them said, no, no, thank you. <laughs> no way. Uh, and then, but one of them said, well, $5 million would be an estimate, but I sure wouldn't bid it. So it weren't any bidders, but we had that figure. Then we said, okay, environmental laws say that if it's poisoned building, which it is, it, they, they oiled all the machinery with PCB from it for its entire life. The concrete floor is soaked in PCB, which can be encapsulated, but we didn't discuss that. But the estimate to clean it up was $13 million. So 13 and 5 is $18 million to tear down a world-class building at the intersection of Town Lake and Shoal Creek. Duh. So we got the council to put together a committee. The committee debated all this. Uh, the committee published a report. Council voted 7-0 to preserve it. For And they gave some suburban site to Austin Utility to tell them to go away. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was to be preserved for civic educational uh, purposes, public purpose. Well, when they got into it, the city was unwilling to really support that effort, so the developer that won the deal kind of had to pivot to the private sector. So it's mostly all private sector now. Athena Health is now in the most magnificent space in the state. I tell people two things. One, I never went into a space that was as interesting. You know, I've been in St. Peter's, I've been in Hagia Sophia, I've been in most of those places. They're fantastic buildings and symbols, but not as interesting as the guts of this industrial thing. Uh, I described it to some of the people in the office as made me feel like I was an eighth of an inch tall walking around inside of a giant block of Swiss cheese <laughs> because the spaces just go forever. And it's 91 feet from the floor down there to the top of the roof up there. So it's a pretty impressive place. The city turned it over to a developer, uh, and the developer hired uh, Sussman Tisdale Gale to do the buildings and clean it up. That's Boiler 9 on the inside right there, by the way. Uh, and, and that's Boiler 9 on the end down there. It's bigger than the other ones, and the other ones are hollowed out as entrances into the, from the plaza to the building. It's really a, if you haven't seen it, you should go down there. It's a really, really pretty cool place. <coughs> and it's, it's everything I ever dreamed it could be, honestly. I'm sorry I didn't get to do it. <laughs> STG got to do it, but they did a good job, and I'm really happy it there. It's on a par with the Pearl in San Antonio, but quite different. Um, they have a lot more land, <laughs> for one thing. That's, this is having dinner in Boiler 9, looking out through the glass 
down through the rest of the frames that were the other boilers. Somewhere along the line, we had an office at 23rd Street in Tri Towers building. There were two architects and an engineer. And so um, Ross Perot bought that building and sent his lawyer to evict us. Well, we had about six months of negotiating the ex le lease extension, so that established certain rights, our lawyer said. So that happened on a Monday, and on a Friday, we went to court, sued Ross Perot for $5,000. He lost, we got the $5,000, and we spent the weekend moving out. <laughs> In the meantime, we had gone downtown, I, I actually did it, this, went downtown and discovered this group of uh, two buildings and, uh, in fact, uh, one that had burned in 1965. Uh, and so we went to work uh, immediately. Uh, we came up with this concept here, which was to dig out the section, the, the, the centerpiece where the building burned, was, had didn't have a basement, the other two did. So we did a diagrammatic sketch, this is the power of diagramming, by the way, mm -hmm. sketch showing a two-story building, a three-story building, and a plug of dirt, and two basements. Wait a minute, if we dig that out, we just added 40% of usable space to this building. Voila, get the bulldozer. So we got the bulldozer. That was it being reamed out. <laughs> There's the bulldozer, or the front end loader, or whatever. But just drive in, get a scoop, lift it up, and that made it too wide to turn around. So he just backed out into the middle of 4th Street, and there was a dump truck sitting there, so he dumped it in and went and did it again. That area, that district was so deserted that we did that whole thing, including dynamiting holes for trees, with no permit. <laughs> which as far as I'm concerned is the only way to do a project. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it didn't, it created a terrible place because it didn't have a permit. <laughs> it immediately became the most popular scene in town and it was immediately written up in the Los Angeles Times and the, and the New York Times and you can imagine that for somewhere in Texas, some hick town, they've got a bar. <laughs> and they served the coolest martinis <laughs> ever. <laughs> it was, you know, as things ha happened that way, they're pretty condescending, but it, it was national and even international news that this could and did happen. And um, for the first five or ten years, basically, there would be a line around the block. It'd kind of go right up there and take off and go all the way around the block, or not all the way, but halfway. And then the fire department said, well, you can only have so many people, and you know how that goes. They found us. <laughs> <laughs> but it was too late. <laughs> so there have been a series of restaurants uh, in there. This was my favorite. It, the chef was a spoiled brat and wanted a bigger kitchen, so they moved. But then somebody else came in, and you know, it's never been vacant uh, since the mid-'90s. Uh, now we're going to move up in scale again. We were asked by uh, uh, Forest City, which is no less than the biggest, strongest development entity in this country, to do a scheme, work with the Dallas architect and Don Bossy, the landscape architect, to do a scheme for uh, the green water treatment plant, which looked like that at that time. And uh, we thought, well, let's pretty terrific idea. It's everything you <coughs> see to the left except the Point Tower, which was under construction or already there. And one of the, the early scheme by the Dallas architect showed a lot of density but not much architecture. And then we, we worked on it in a pretty short time. I mean, we're talking about two weeks or something like that. Uh, and we worked on a, hello, worked on a scheme which uh, wound up uh, I didn't like 
especially that much, but the Dallas architect was a gorilla, and so we we sort of had to do what we could. Uh, the this is now the library. This is the sea home plant and the intake structure, and right there is everything I just showed you about sea home. Remember the boilers back here, boiler nine on the end. Um, and so th this was a, a net of four and a half acres that's after the streets were all put back in. And it's mostly built out now, as is the library. So all of this stuff comes to pass sooner or later. For me, it's all ways <coughs> 15 years. I've gone back and done all the calculations. On Sea Home, it was 30, but mostly the 15 years from the idea to some kind of reality. Um, and you know, in our in our presentations, we probably had uh, oh a dozen analogies. Like this was supposed this is Spanish Steps, and that was what we was wanted to spill down to uh, Shoal Creek. The city still owned the land, so they just built a retaining wall there. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, and we had all kinds of uh, great places to talk about, uh, you know, like that. Uh, and the developer liked all that, so. And then came a couple of years ago, or four, maybe the uh, Softeel Plaza, 11 acres of old railroad switching area on the red line, this Cap Metro station there. And so what we proposed was that this swings over to 4th Street, which is now done. Um, and then we proposed a rather large, this is just a diagram, but uh, proposal, I think it was I don't know, maybe a billion dollars worth of construction or something like that, with a, a major hotel there with uh, a, a really big office building there and a smaller office building there and a point tower there and theaters in there above parking. Uh, and then the buildings would get begin to get smaller, like six stories, five stories, four stories. And, and the overall density if you take away the, that front block, which is on 35, uh, was only about 50 units per acre, which is not so extreme. We've been doing that in downtown with buildings for the past 10 years. So it wasn't such a big extreme push. So that's the hotel fronting uh, the whole thing and uh, the, the views of the city. That's the really big office building, a small office building. And that's the point tower, and then the other buildings are so neighborhood friendly you don't even see them in the drawing. <laughs> uh, this was the train station uh, right there uh, next to the uh, small office building, and the theaters were entered right over here. Really kind of all went together. So at the time we were designing the Emily downtown building that I showed you, we were also uh, commissioned to do the, uh, again with Gerard, to do the Great Streets Master Plan. So our little team then worked about a year, I guess, uh, to do the Great Streets Master Plan. And one of the points I wanted to make was how bad Second Street was, <laughs> because we part of the focus was because that was going to be the retail corridor. To put a lot of time on that one, and so. Um, we looked everywhere. There were no pictures. Nobody was dumb enough to take a picture of a street that ugly. <laughs> you got it? So we found it in my collection. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know why I took it. I think I was just so shocked to see two pedestrians and a tree. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or, or I had this great affinity for old industrial buildings. I might have been fascinated with that. Anyway, so this is Second Street before. This is Second Street after. And you see that uh, W right there? That, that was their construction trailer before they started to work on the W Hotel. And there was a guy in my office who had a friend at uh, W. And one day we were talking about some of his proposed projects and he picks up the phone and, and talking to a guy named Jamie. 
said, oh, you picked a site, finally. Where is it? Oh, that site. Why that site? Okay, Jamie, I'll talk to you later. So he hangs up and says, that was Jamie Lagarta of uh, Starwood, and W is one of their brands, and his job was to find the site. So he picked block, I think it's block 21, which I knew exactly what that was at the time. And uh, that's going to be the site for the new W. Wow, really? I mean, not really. I could have told you that a year ago because there, were <laughs> no, there weren't any better choices. I said, you ask him why that site. What did he say? He said, uh, uh, Craig, Craig, have you seen that street? And so it seems to me that that probably was the deciding moment for that. And of course, after that W announced that, that's kind of the beginning of a long story of building big buildings. All the way th across Congress Avenue for the JW Marriott Thousand Room Hotel. And you'd say, well, uh, that would have happened anyway. The economy is so strong in Austin. Well, yeah, maybe. It didn't happen in 85 years before <laughs> the great streets got done. So there's got to be some small connection there. And this is, if you have time, go down to Crew and get a glass of wine and sit on a nice evening like tonight, on not all the nights we've had lately, and just enjoy that. Now that I'm pretty proud of. And that. Remember that beat up old street that nobody had a picture of? <laughs> okay. So this is about, that's about Second Street as the uh, example uh, of the Great Streets Master Plan that Gerard and I and Ellie McKinney and Donna Carter and a few other miscellaneous consultants put together in a year. The master plan covered 310 blocks of land, I think it was. It had uh, 18 uh, street, it had six developed street types and 18 descriptions of special streets that didn't fit into that, like 12th, Congress, Sabine, some others. And, and the standards were pretty well spelled out in these kinds of diagrams uh, like this. This is, uh, well, first of all, our philosophy was to get 50% of the territory in 80 foot right away uh, for the pedestrians. We failed. We only got uh, 55, 45%, which, which is a 75% increase over what they have now, pedestrians. So it, it <coughs> shifted the balance away from cars pretty radically. And we, we uh, Gerard uh, was on a, on a design commission before this all happened and got a policy passed <coughs> which said with regard to streets, pedestrians have number one priority, transit number two priority, bicycles number three priority, and cars go to hell. <laughs> And so we use that as official policy, so not to go to hell part, but, but we use that to beat up on the traffic engineers for a year. And finally they just, okay, narrower lanes, so forth. Second Street is special because it's offset a little bit. It's not 18 feet on the south side, it's 16, but it's 32 on the other side. And it's not two rows of parking, it's just one. And it's not one row of trees, it's two rows of trees and so it's, it was kind of special, pulled out as something special because it was going to be the, the cross-town pedestrian way. Um, now, let's go up in scale one more time. <laughs> um, that is IH-35 from the north. Uh, you can see what it does, 51st Street Airport. You can see what it does to the city. It just slices it and dices it right in half. That's all elevated right there. So the noise and pollution is projected way into neighborhoods. And we don't even know exactly how much damage that does. There's a lot of information out there about uh, learning retardation and future problems, et cetera. 
Sanchez Elementary School, which is down here somewhere, is a block and a half away. And uh, this is really serious stuff. Does TxDOT care? No. TxDOT doesn't care. You'll have to take our word for it, because we're the only people dumb enough to arm wrestle TxDOT for four years. <laughs> and we're not done yet. As Juan said, I may be retiring from teaching so I can travel, but that's just going to give me more ideas, <laughs> <laughs> including ideas from his hometown of Madrid. Okay, this is their idea of upgrading IH-35, right? It's taller, <coughs> and it's wider, and it will be a bigger liability than we have now for the next 60 or 75 years. We really want to kick that can down the road. By that time, of course, there won't be any cars, but uh, I mean, it's, it's a horrific example of, of their design philosophy, which it, it does not include the city at all. They could care less about the city as long as they can shave seconds off of people's travel as they whiz up and down here from nowhere to nowhere. This is our version of that. Okay, TxDOT, we love you. We want to put you down here where you're really safe. And if you're going from Canada to Mexico, you don't even have to know whenever you pass through Austin except the sunlight went away for a while. Rebuild the city. The highway now takes 320 feet of right-of-way, 320. What we propose is a boulevard parkway, East Avenue Parkway, which is what it always was before TxDOT came along, clobbered it. Uh, it's 160. That means you have 80 feet to add to the remnant parcels that were left when, wha when TxDOT whacked its way through there like a, the world's largest machete is, came down and killed that part of Austin. So, uh, w you know, and these are all mixed-use buildings. These sidewalks are the second street, 32-foot wide ones with double rows of trees, median with more trees, 2,000 trees between Thing Keaton and, and uh, the lake. Part of the problem is that we could only get the downtown community to worry about 15th to the south. And then we mentioned it to the med school people and the, and, and, and the hospital district, and all of a sudden, uh, all of a sudden they were saying, well, we may, we may bury it and we'll go as far as MLK. Empowered with that, we said, okay, now what happens if you go to Dean Keaton and beyond? How about 51st Street? One consequence of that is the next 40 acres. Anybody ever heard of the 40 acres? <laughs> this is the next 40 acres. Uh, this is the diagram that explains uh, that everything in red there is essentially uh, the wasted part of the right-of-way. And why I say it's wasted is because when you put the main lanes below, you can put the access roads on the surface in the form of a boulevard and like any great city with boulevards, there it's civilized traffic because the grid is put back. So we have, I think <coughs> it's 12 connections back that relieve the congestion uh, uh, on the surface, uh, but it, it gives you choice. And so that, that this is the territory that then absorbs into the adjacent blocks. Uh, and some of these remnants where it, the right-of-way whacked it off over here become real blocks. They have a building just like Amelie, 230 units on the creek, on the boulevard, walk to work. The corridor is, has significant investment now, very significant. Obviously, that's a significant investment. Medical school, the hospital district, uh, the tunnel on Water Creek and all the all the work that inevitably comes after that to make the uh, the longest, I think, uh, urban creek corridor redo in, in the U.S. 
this would be a while to get the money. Uh, the convention center area, and that's Saltillo Plaza, our version of it you show, we showed you before. By the way, we didn't get that project. And then uh, what's over here, this darker area here, that's a quarter mile or a five minute walk from all that investment. Okay, between 15th and the river, we calculated at 50 units per acre again, you could get over 4,000 living units plus a couple of hotels, plus a couple of office buildings, plus like, uh, I guess, five, 600,000 square feet of retail that could be supported by those wide sidewalks in a 20 year spreadsheet scenario. Well, that's a growth rate less, less of a push than what we're doing right now all over town. So there's no reason to be afraid of that. And we only have one goal. That's it. The Passage de Gracia in Barcelona. Barcelona has all the best streets, has the best hierarchy of streets of any city in the world. And the best of the best is this one. It's got parking underneath it. It's got service along both sides. And it's, uh, that, that's what we want to walk on that used to be underneath IH-35. So, with that travel through time and scale, <laughs> uh, just have one thing to say. I see everything, and I do mean everything, as a design opportunity. Or, I mean, if I had time, I'd rearrange your seating pattern. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's pathological probably dangerous, and I know it isn't healthy. So thank you very much. <laughs> well, I think, well, I was going to say, why don't we go down to the exhibit, okay. and then you can We'll mail around and you can ask me questions and if you're interested